is not only what is legal, but what is illegal for police to do in these cases, and we have to have everyone and hold everyone accountable. And finally, the issue was raised about the number of people that have been killed at the hands of law enforcement officials and how there is no central manner in which we collect that data. That has to end. We know the strategy is and the reality is in order to manage a problem, you must first measure it. In order to manage a problem, you must first measure it. What that means is that every time a police officer kills someone or anyone working in an official law enforcement capacity, that data must be collected. The Death in Custody Act passed the U.S. House of Representatives at the leadership of Congressman Bobby Scott and is now pending before the U.S. Senate. We must pass that bill before the U.S. Senate. We must not allow the Congress to go home until we have the most basic of tools to collect the data. And finally, there are two websites I want you to go and take a look at in addition to the wonderful sites being shared. One of them is the NAACP's website, and this is going to be hard to remember, but the website address, NAACP.org. NAACP.org. We want to make sure all that data is there. And finally, here locally, there's a great process going on now being led by Patrice Sultan. It's a process in which we're trying to collect the data real here and close to home at www.dcpoliceproject.com. www.dcpoliceproject.com. You can begin collecting that data, giving your name to these issues, and making sure as these issues move forward, not only do you show up at programs like this one, but you engage every step of the process. Politics, process, procedure, determining who gets what, when, where, and how must always be driven by us. It is not a spectator sport. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Brother Hillary Shelton of the NAACP, Director of the NAACP's Washington Bureau. Sisters and brothers, let's give a warm applause to thank our panelists for our wonderful presentations this evening. When, when we at the Institute of the Black World uh, decided to put this forum together, we wanted to make it truly a town hall meeting and give, give an opportunity for not only these panelists but for other voices to be heard. And so we are asking uh, several uh, of our special guests to, uh, to come forward and make very crisp, succinct remarks. One minute, <laughs> because time is moving on. Uh, in response to what they heard this evening from the panelists. And I'm going to call first on young man, Brother Leighton Watson, who is the Howard University, representing Howard University Student Association. Uh, if you can come up to this standing mic right here and make your comment very crisp. Good evening. My name is Layden Watson. I'm a student body president at Howard University. And I want to make one thing. I want to make one thing very clear. If you couldn't tell by the hands up picture, if you couldn't tell by the vigil that we hosted, and if you can't tell by this Friday when Howard is going down to Ferguson with 50 Howard University students to do voter registration, Howard University stands by Michael Brown, and Howard University stands by the city of Ferguson. That's very clear. The second thing I want to say is I'm very impressed, but I'm not surprised, at the number of great ideas that came from this panel. I want everybody to clap that up, because that's incredible. But my, my, my thing is, the discussion is one portion, but I think we have to have a second part to this discussion, which is where we talk about how to merge our individual efforts into one collective effort. Yes. That's the second half of this conversation. I know as students, what we're doing is we're hosting the HBCU conference um, on September 17th through the 21st, where we've invited all 106 HBCUs to our university's campus. And there we're actually going to have students do sessions and then go to Capitol Hill to lobby on voter registration, voting rights, and this gun violence. So. I, the one thing that I, I think about every time that we go through this is that the enemy, they're counting on the fact that we can't take the next step. That's right. They're counting on the fact that we can't sustain this effort. That's right. 
They're counting on the fact that, honestly, that we can't get over our individual logos and get over our individual egos and actually come together and make something happen. We are, we have to be very, very real with ourselves. We're 13% of the population as African Americans. 13% of the population. We don't have room for division. We don't have the luxury to have individual separate efforts. We have to come together. I thank you guys for this conversation, but there definitely is a part two, and just know that Howard University is ready to be part of that part two. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lakin Lawson, Howard University Student Association. Uh, I'm going to call now on uh, Nana Dr. Pat Newton from the Black Psychiatrists of America. Nana, can you make it up here? Thank you. Hotel, brothers and sisters. I want to thank the, I, um, Dr. Daniels and IBW, and we want to say that the Black Psychiatrist stands on the vanguard of the, of the immediate and the long-term healing. There are damages that are going to be well into centuries after this Ferguson experience. And let us not forget, as one of the council people said, we've got to be in this for the long haul. The Black Psychiatrists believe that that police should be screened before they're ever hired. And they have to have screening that also includes cultural sensitivity and cultural diversity. Yeah. Not just a little job psychological test, but we have to also make sure that we put the kind of men and women behind that badge who will serve us well and serve us in terms of, of, of adequate in terms of compassion and in terms of caring for our people. So we want to recommend that our relationship is not over because we have post-traumatic and acute traumatic stress as a result of what has happened. And these children are going to be damaged for centuries and the next generations, and we already just got the data about how trauma affects people into future generations. So we're looking at talking about civil issues related to not just the criminal side, but what you're gonna do to defend and bring community effort and money and economic resources from both the federal and state level to make sure that they get treated. And so we wanna partner with the Black Police Association to make make sure we develop the kind of tools that are needed to save our people and stop this from what we are coming. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pat. Dr. Pat Newton. And let me just say very quickly that uh, the Black Psychiatrists of America is one of 23 national organizations that comprise yes. the Black Family Summit, which is a grouping that uh, IBW, Institute of the Black World, has pulled together. For more information on the Black Family Great. Summit, please visit our website, ibw21.org. Thank you, Nana Pat. I'm now going to call on uh, Brother Salim Adolfo of the National Black United Front. Brother Salim. Thank you. First, I want to say black power and that this issue right here on the ground is an issue of reparations. The police killings is another reason why people of African descent are owed reparations. And we know that justice is not going to take place in the voting booth. Justice is going to take place in the streets and the combination of the voting booth. So with that being said, we're going into 8th Street this Saturday to shut down 8th Street. If there's not going to be no justice, then they won't have no damn economic peace. If we can't get no justice, they won't have no economic peace. Last week, we shut down Chinatown. This week, Saturday, August 30th, we're going to meet at Union Station, 7 o'clock, we're going into A Street and shut A Street down. If we can't get no justice, there won't be no economic peace. Thank you. Okay, thank you, brother. Well, Salim Adalco of the National Black United Front. I'd like to call on uh, Brother Malik Burnett of the Drug Policy Alliance. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Dr. Malik Burnett. I'm a medical doctor, and I'm a policy manager here in the Office of National Affairs at the Drug Policy Alliance, uh, the nation's leading drug policy organization. And uh, I wanted to uh, offer something. Uh, my, my good friend, uh, Makechi, uh, offered the idea to think outside the box. Well, this is definitely an outside-the-box idea. So this November 4th, uh, we have the opportunity uh, 
to legalize marijuana in the District of Columbia. Marijuana is the major input to the system of mass incarceration across the United States. The, uh, here in D.C., 91% of African Americans are, 91% of drug arrests are of African Americans. And 50% of all drug arrests are of marijuana. So first, you've got to register to vote. It's critical that everybody registers to vote in the District of Columbia. And then secondly, you have to vote yes on Initiative 71. Again, vote yes on Initiative 71 on November 4th. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Next, I'm going to call on Reverend Graylon Hagler from the Plymouth Congressional Church here in Washington, D.C. Thank you. I want to thank the, the panel, which you did all a tremendous job in terms of breaking down the issue. I think that one of the things, though, that I want to lift up is as we talk about the militarization of police forces, we need to talk about also the training that goes into the police forces, that you have foreign governments training police departments on how to occupy communities. Now let's be clear about that, that's what's going on. When the IDF and your brother Jasiri X was with me in Palestine in January. And so he knows that there is this training that goes on with every single police department in America on how to occupy, how to make your presence known, which is to brutalize a community in order to keep a community contained. So when we talk about demilitarization, we need to talk about also home growing those who can go on the police force. In DC and other jurisdictions, in DC you gotta have you got to have two years of education to be able to qualify to go on a police department. You can't come out of high school and apply for the police department, but you can go to the military with just a high school diploma, and by coming out of the military, you can go on the Metropolitan Police Department. Does that make sense? When we got 40% unemployment in housing projects, we need to open up those opportunities so that women and men can go on and serve their cities in the community in which they grew up in, and therefore, there won't be this fear that permeates the police department when they come into a community and occupy it and are scared of their residents. Thank you, Reverend Hagler. Uh, I'm going to also now move on to the, our final two respondents. Uh, let me see here. Reverend uh, Dr. Joseph uh, Evans uh, of the Mount Carmel Baptist Church. Thank you, thank you. First of all, give it up for IBW. Come on, somebody, give it up. The most significant on the edge organization that has brought us together is IBW. And if you're outside, still outside, please join it. IBW 21.org. Now, I want to just simply say this. There is a combination between race, economics, and politics. That's not me, that's W.E.B. Du Bois. And it continues even today. And we we're talking about Ferguson and the physical act of murder. But I want you to know something. They are still lynching black men today. And one of the most significant places you can go is the nation's capital because the current mayor has not been indicted for anything. No charges have been put against him, but it was a banana republic election because gentrification is real in Washington. And if you can get that brother out the way, let me tell you, all the dominoes will fall. So make sure you understand. I'm not talking about politics now. I'm talking about a black man who's been lynched simply because he's a black man in charge. And they're going to get rid of every one of them so that this city will no longer be a majority black people. Wake up, D.C. It's going on right in front of you every single day. I'm out. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we also want to recognize uh, Brother Talim Karim, Talib Karim, from STEM for Us, and the Tech Law Group. Is he? I'm right here. Thank you, Brother. First of all, Brother Don Ross, I want to give it up to you, because you've been one of our mentors in the technology and science space for the past 20 years. So I really want to, first of all, say how grateful I am. And of course, give it up for all the distinguished panelists and, and also Brother uh, 
Andy Shalau, I know he's here. So here at STEM for us, we had an ex extensive conversation about a week ago right after the, the, the tragedy. And one of the things we realized, and we had uh, Brother Keenan Keller on that call, is that until we deal with the issue of reparations, we're going to continue to have these types of things happen time and time again. One of the things we particularly pointed out is that because black men in particular are stereotyped by the media every day, it's stated that a child has seen, particularly in the black community, an average of 20,000 murders before he reaches first grade, right? And most of the murders are committed by people who look like himself. So what we did, Brother Don, is we challenged Comcast and Yahoo and Google, because they're now owning and distributing content, we challenged them to put together a fund we believe that there needs to be a, at least a $3 trillion fund put together to not only provide once and for all reparations, but also to give us a better selection of content. No more should we only see black people as villains, but we should see beautiful brown and, and black and red and yellow people being scientists and technologists and physicians and mathematicians. And so that's what we're challenging all of our colleagues who are on Capitol Hill to rally with us on the 24th of September. We're having a STEM showcase and forum at the Pepco Gallery. For more information, go and visit STEM, the number four, US. Dot org, that's STEM for us, dot org. And again, I salute you for all the great work that you continue to do there, brother. Thank you so much, Brother Talib Karim. Uh, Ms. Minister Abdul Qadi Mohammed of the Nation of Islam, can you come up to the, to the microphone? Are you? And, and after Brother Minister Abdul Mohammed, I'm going to call on Dr. Marsha Coleman Adebayo. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. First of all, I want to thank Ryan Davis for allowing us to come here and gather today at Bus Boys and Poets. And to get right to the point, I want to thank this panel who brought to us a very, very welcome and a great discussion. What do you think? Yes, sir. All praise is due to Allah now. Basically, the young people today have spoken. We need more like Brother Jasiri X. We need more that's in the streets. And the one thing that I think that we left out and that is to stop the black on black crime among the young brothers in the streets. If we can take our, we can take the leadership up into some of these projects and get them to stop shooting each other every single night, then I do know the plan. The plan is that they're gonna to try to come in with the National Guard and once we stop killing each other, then it's automatically wiped out the black community. So let's unite together. Let's stand together, let us work together as one kind of cause, make sure our people are free and doing the right thing to help us in this great nation. Thank you so much, God bless. Thank you, Brother Minister. <laughs> sister Dr. Marsha Coleman at by the way, this, this is the sister who organized the protest at the De Department of Justice today. Give it up for her. Hands up! Hands up! Don't shoot! Hands up! Don't shoot! Thank you so much. I want to thank uh, Dr. Daniels and this incredible uh, panel. It was, it was an incredibly enlightening panel. And I also want to thank everyone who participated in the demonstration today. We took it to the street today. We took it to the street today, and we're going to take it back to the street today, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. And also, by the way, we have made it uh, very difficult for the Attorney General to say that he doesn't understand our demand, because we forced the Department of Justice to bring down one of their officials from the AJ's office to receive our petition today. And so what he is wrestling with today, I'd like to just give you three of our demands before I sit down. One, demand, the immediate arrest and prosecution of police officer Darren Wilson. Yeah, yeah, we want it yeah. now. We're, we're not going to negotiate this That's point. Right. We also want the end of mass incarceration of boys and men of color and to release those 
and let me tell you, this is very important. It's not just stopping mass incarceration. We want our sons and our brothers and our husbands to come home right. who are in jail right now. Right. And that is not negotiable. And we also want all military personnel and equipment withdrawn from our community.